Uh, hello, everybody. Welcome to the Here We Are podcast. I'm Shane Moss. Um, uh, my, I have a returning guest joining me today. Laura Pasquini is joining me. Thank you. Great to be here. Hi. How are you? Uh, I'm good. I um, uh, so the last time I uh, the last time that we talked, we talked a lot about online um, stuff, uh, on online courses. And um, we were just talking, you, you've had a bit of a shift. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit, yes. <laughs> Since the last time we talked, but, it, but you're still doing online um, teaching and courses. And I, I thought of you because at the time, however many years ago that was, I, I remember being um, very, telling you that I was very excited about how I thought kind of this was the future of education for a lot of people. And, uh, and, and I've, I've been taking online courses myself for maybe like 10 years or something. Mm -hmm. And, um, and since, um, uh, since that time, last year I started actually, um, I, I'm often sponsored by the great courses plus, yeah. have you heard of them? I have. That's yeah. Good. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of great companies out there, and I'm not, I don't I mean to make this like a whole marketing thing for them. Go to greatcoursesplus.com <laughs> slash here we are to get your free trial today. But there are there are a ton of uh, great options out there. Do you, do you have any that you like? Yeah, there's no shortages of places to learn. And I think it's really cool that you do have them as a sponsor because you could pick up tons of uh free webinars courses things to learn i don't know i learn a lot from honestly podcasts these days there's some really clever people are producing podcasts that are really smart and then just to discover this medium and um so i probably learn more from some podcasts and some uh i guess some of the future learn courses is where i was looking at courses at one point that's out of the uk but yeah there's no shortage it depends on what the topic is and whether yeah. it's a book a podcast or a cor free course then you, you have any uh you have any other podcasts you've been digging lately besides of course regularly listening to the here we are podcast probably Obviously. multiple <laughs> times a week how, how many times do you listen to like each of my episodes like under five or or more than five depends on your guests uh, plus, plus <laughs> minus five uh yeah no i really think there's some clever clever shows out there uh one of them well, I, li I like a lot of story and I've been, le I've been leaning into um, like other story podcasts, like obviously The Moth and whatnot. But one of them I like lately because we don't have sports is the Hall of Shame podcast. Mm. And it's a comedian and one that's a sports writer, two women that produce them out of Crooked Media. And they go back to like a story about the first female marathoner who won but cheated. Or hmm. like, there's different like stories about sports and stuff. So I guess I've been digging that one. Um, yeah, the other one, like things that depends on what I want to be learning at that point. I really like uh, Adam Grant's work life. Also, he talks about actually he's caught up a couple episodes on loneliness, which is timely now. And, and mm -hmm. loneliness before we even went into pandemic and lockdown mode. Like, how do people uh, find community at work? And so that kind of interested me because of. Uh, that's what I study is looking at people and how we connect and com find community online. And so I'm sure your podcast does that for many people as well. So I think that's great. Mm. You're still producing content for your community that don't want to just hear about uh, the Rona and all that stuff. Yeah. And I, I mean, I, I've, I've been, I've, I've definitely jumped on the pandemic as an opportunity to re-examine so many parts of 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 life i mean i've had i've had a virology and like an immune person on here and everything and and, mm -hmm. and and that's important but i just feel like you know that's already kind of on the news quite a bit and like all right we're all virologists <laughs> no <laughs> and, and you're I, an it, epidemiologist <laughs> or you're either like uh some sort of protester on the other side so yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, um and, and i and i hope to have more and continue to get updates but for me i've seen this as an opportunity to just re-examine all of life so i've been having so many different people of, of different fields and as someone who's been an advocate for uh, what uh, so so the really positive things that i love coming out of this is people getting 
it, you know, there's a lot of people working remotely that would rather not be working remotely, but there are a lot of people get it, getting the opportunity to work remotely that I'm sure have been wanting to do that for yeah. a long time. And same with education, although there's like, uh, you know, you, you can't beat the hands-on experience of, of the university, the, the ability for anyone in the world to take some class from a Harvard professor or something, usually for free or for very cheap. I think great courses, I don't even know off the top of my head, it's like $15 a month or so. They used to be like $300 a course or something like that. And you'd like order the DVDs. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so just in the time that I've been doing online courses, it's gone from like $300 a course to like $15 a month unlimited. And there's plenty of other like free things out there and everything else. Um, and so I'm excited to, to see that. And then, and then you're, you're now doing, I guess some of your new work that you're doing is some online training stuff. Can you talk a little bit about that? And, and yeah. so you were kind of doing this before the Rona, right? Yes. But now it's like, <laughs> but now it's in high gear, right? Yeah. So, uh, when we last talked, I was teaching at university, um, and I was, my, all my classes were online and ironically for five years, I was a faculty who'd go to campus once or twice a week because I taught primarily online and I worked remotely. And so for all my colleagues now that have shifted to like continuity of instruction, I always said, this is just like emergency teaching. This is not actually what remote work looks like, online life looks like. You're just trying to figure it out to get to the end of the semester. Mm -hmm. um, for all educators, I said, honestly, remote life is great when you're given it and you've planned for it and you already knew that your class is going to be online, but now you're just kind of figuring it out. So I was doing that. I enjoyed my remote life as an academic and a researcher, but I have switched into training. So what I taught was how do we train people in general and how do we do that digitally so I work for a small company up in Seattle um, and we shut down in Seattle back in end of February so we stopped traveling end of February um, I work for uh, a bigger company that said let's close things down and work from home from March 5th onwards so I relocated remotely to my house in Dallas where I was because I had just moved up in February and so I'm between two locations my stuff and moving um, and so being back in Dallas and working remotely is fine because I have a company that's set up for that with a VPN and we have our, my team is global so I'm in like 12 different countries what's so a VPN that sort of thing uh, virtual private network. <laughs> so oh. when people go remote and you have seek, uh, confidentiality ah. documents and things you want to have in a private network, a virtual private network, a VPN, uh, saves that and makes it secure. So everyone else who kind of didn't have that set up and there's no shortage of corporations that don't do that because everyone thinks they have to come to work, have to now figure out how do we do that with our team? at their own house in some unsecure network so yeah that's kind of been a weird situation and transition and i don't know i don't think this is exactly what remote life looks like for people normally um because you don't have kids dogs other humans roommates running around your background or mm -hmm. um yeah you don't have like you kind of had planned for this if you're a remote worker or we're doing telework before you had a good setup and you have an office um so uh, I think it's been a struggle for some, at least to my knowledge. So, yeah. Yeah, it's, I was just, <laughs> this is, I, I just had the idea that, um, that people, because I've, I've had, I've had a couple interviews interrupted by people's children or whatever, mm -hmm. and it's double, but it's annoying to that person. And then to like, uh, 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 the poor lonely viewer out there without any company. <laughs> They're like, I wish I, I had wish a dog I... interrupting me right now. I think the new business that's going to come up is people renting out kids and dogs to run in the background <laughs> of their of their video conferencing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. That's a fun idea. I, I think. I hope that this gives some people some idea of what remote work can be and flexible life working and teaching online is, but it's, it looks different though. You have a choice to do it, not being forced into it like now. And so yeah, that's I think the, that's the difference. The, that's a huge, huge difference. You know, I was just talking on a recent episode and we've, we've talked in the past of like, um, of your, um, uh, you know, is this, is this a choice or not? Uh, mm -hmm. like, are you, 
are you single by choice or are you single because you can't find someone? <laughs> are, are, are you, uh, you know, did yeah. you have a kid that you, uh, that you wanted or an, or an accident? You know, there's so much right. of life is right. like that. But we're like solitary confinement is, is the, one of the greatest punishments on, on earth. But it's also one of the greatest privileges to be able to like have the money and schedule to be able to go to a silent totally. retreat where you're doing the exact same thing that prisoners get for punishment and but because you're doing it by choice this is like this great life-changing opportunity that, that like yeah. is on your bucket list I think it's weird times, but I think as we start seeing um, parts of the country in the U.S. In the US um, open up, we're going to have get that question put out to us by where we work is only some of you can come in or only we want some of you, we want to know what your barriers and challenges are. And so I'm in a state that's opening up. I've, I'm in Texas right now. Um, so they are giving people options of when you come back. What does that look like for you? Or do you want to be working from home? And what does that look like for us? Mm. Um, so I think I think we should start thinking about like how do we want to work and live and learn digitally because not everyone's gonna come back hundred percent, at least for this year to year and a half until we have something, right? So yeah. I always I'm, I'm thinking about the universities and colleges and even workplaces that do training because I have a team that's split. So I work on the side of the team that does the design of the curriculum digitally or in a blended format, but then we have trainers that are on site around the world they're actually doing virtual instruction now and that's been a switch like how do we do that what's a good way to be creative about it um, but I also think about um, what's going to happen in the fall because not everyone's going to go back to a campus or an office so what would that look like when when you have a choice and what would your choice be and I would probably mm. be happy at home but I have a lot of people like I would love to be in there part-time because I can't focus at home or it's too much going on yeah yeah I mean a lot of people um would a, a, a lot of people would still like the ability to like work remotely but like go and do it at a coffee shop or, or, or something <laughs> yeah, like that yes exactly so, so it will you know the, I, I i do think that this is a nice catalyst for change and creating opportunity the, 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 this is it's an unfortunate situation that we're forced to do this and everyone's right. scrambling my god the the number of mistakes that i've made trying to like get everything on a virtual platform and 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 of the just pulling my uh my hair the the the, uh, the only good feature that i have left after six weeks in quarantine <laughs> and no sun or exercise is this hair of mine that i'm ripping out um <laughs> uh, because of like some little thing where i'm like after two days of screaming at the computer, I'm like, oh, I needed to open that in a Chrome browser. And that's all, <laughs> that's all it was. <laughs> so everyone's having to deal with like little, you know, the IT issues are, you know, I've had so many people, I've had so many people on the podcast being like, you know, isolation and look at like Harlow's monkeys and needing a cloth mother and like we need to touch one another and we need we need personal cut as I yeah we do but we also need how about these fucking tech issues <laughs> that, that's that's what that's what's gonna break most people's <laughs> mental health yeah and I also think like honestly I don't I'm not in a company that uses zoom because we don't trust it uh so I don't have a lot of these meetings that you meet virtually yeah. like this or in a room of 20 I think zoom's exhausting or web conferencing like this is exhausting for a lot of people that what they've done is this is what they did with online learning like let's take our meetings in the conference room and I'll put this into our virtual space and we'll have six hours of them which is really silly and unrealistic yeah. and not productive so I hope beyond like the technology I hope people think realistically do we always have to meet and do our meetings have to be an hour and do like yeah, how do we actually yeah. do the work in more productive ways and i hope that technologies reveal that not only the technical glitches but like how we set up our structure our life our schedules at work is stupid and maybe you yeah. all have to just work on your own and be productive and we trust you and 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 kind of the other side of of things too is that i'm realizing like oh you know sometimes i like video calling more than actual call I, I don't think I'd almost, mm -hmm. I, I've pretty much never done a video call in my life. And now I video <laughs> call with a lot of friends and stuff. I, I mean, I'd done like yeah. a couple, 
Um, but, um, and, and so, so that's like making me, you know, we're all going to learn what we like about this and what we don't like. And then hopefully once, once things go back to normal, we'll get to keep the things that we want and, 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 um, and go back to the things that we miss. Um, I, I have, I mean, I think there's so many, I had this guy, Elliot Wiener on him. He's coming back on it. Dude does this mind blowing, um, work with uh vr he he's like the head of oh god i've i have the worst memory i i want to say ames or something what's a big university in outside of des moines iowa is it ames anyway there's university it's like, of iowa yeah university of iowa it's like the mm -hmm. biggest vr um mm -hmm. facility and i went in there and i saw like like i went into a whole virtual room where um a surgeon can go in and virtually go inside like someone's brain inside someone's mri to have a better sense of of where um some like block is or some aneurysm is or whatever before mm -hmm. they go in and operate there's like um there there was there was uh they, they have farmers come in and drive virtual tractors before they go into production and making the tractors there's right. a, a, and there's a, there's all these like um it just in time virtual training things of like okay you're an expert mechanic but you've never worked on this particular piece of machine so first we're going to virtually train you on how how this one works and um and and so because of this, I, th I think it's going to be the catalyst for, for speeding along stuff like that um, mm -hmm. a lot faster. What are some of the advantages of virtual training? For forget before this happened. Uh, what, what were the advantages of virtual um, uh, training for you before this? Yeah, I think because um, you're talking more like VR, AR, but just virtual in general means um, v VR, a AR. What's AR? Aug augmented reality. Oh, okay. So virtual no. meaning you're kind of um, exposed and in, into an environment that's uh, making you manipulate things. Augmented might be you see a lens like a Google glasses, or they had um, kind of lenses you could put on. And so let's say I was shopping for a house and I want to look at the rooms you could place in virtual furniture and that would be that would be put another layer on it or you could see where subdivisions would be built on a like a on a map and so you can see what that community looks like um, mm -hmm. so those are really lending to what we call simulated or applied learning experiences and that means just getting exposure so I have um, I'm working with some faculty this week on just an online course on how to create interactive and engagement kind of classrooms online and so they, they really want to know because uh, they work in agriculture or they work in nursing. They're like, how would I actually show someone how to put in an IV and could they get practice to manipulate something? Or if we're going to show about different ways you're going to process or work on the cow milking system and like how can they explain a step-by-step, -step, what would that look like? And it doesn't necessarily have to be in a reality, but they could create um, everything from images to slides to video and do explaining of what that looks like and show people in practice. So I think there's some opportunities um, to expose people to new skills, new abilities and reach com communities that already were remote. So whether it's someone that's not in an urban city center or near a university or college or a credential, but wants to fix something or do something in practice, I think that gets more people the opportunity to learn. And so what we're learning uh, work-wise and around the world, because uh, we have different connectivity issues, so not everyone's gonna be able to jump into a virtual environment, but what could you get them if they're in somewhere um, in India or they're in Manila and they only have this much bandwidth or access to the internet, what could they download, watch, view, and then put into practice? So we're trying to mm. think about virtual and distance becoming back to that remote teaching is how do we get them what they can access and make it portable and download and go. So like a video like this would be um, not only streamed, but they could also download a clip or get like an access to a transcript and also see some step-by-step -step examples that are embedded. It's so like a multimodal approach to how we teach and learn. And so that's kind of what we've been thinking about more because 
Um, for me, where I work, we also not only have to translate to different languages around the world, but we also have to think about how people learn around the globe and what they, when they take that into the classroom, what would that look like in practice? So um, mm -hmm. I think that's what I've been thinking a lot more. Um, there's more opportunity that people, like we talked about last time, care about online learning or see it as valuable. Oh, this is a really value add. And until now, uh, I don't want to say this is a happy accident because I think it's terrible, these weird times we're in, but it's made people realize that they can work and they can learn with um, different tools, technologies, and there are opportunities to work differently than we have been or learn differently than we have been. Hmm. Um, as, as a, you know, I, I do think that this is, um, uh, I, I'm interested in, motivation at the workplace and and i i think that i <laughs> yeah. I, I think that um you know as someone who's worked and done a lot of factory work myself mm -hmm. um i i know that there are you know mo monetized incentives uh and and like you know kind of some supervision or or peace rate or whatever does seem to work in like a factory setting um fairly well but mm -hmm. in, in terms of kind of thought workers uh it just doesn't seem to work as well and it seem it seems like um it, it seems like having a, a i've heard a lot of people talk about you know kind of having having someone look over your shoulder when you're at your cubicle and and yeah. having uh, you know having a thought worker be um uh it, you, you know, if you, if you if you give me a day to write as many jokes as I can in as many in in whatever fashion that I want, or you say from nine to five with breaks at these exact times, um, that's when you're going to work and you got to put out as many jokes as possible. I guarantee the one where I set my own schedule overall, not every day, but o <laughs> overall is going to be uh, higher quality, um, work. And I think a lot of people are going to, I, I think a lot of employers are going to be surprised that some of their workers are actually more productive when they're able to like take breaks from work and, uh, go walk around, uh, the block for a little while and, and yeah. check in at midnight when they wake up in the middle of the night with an idea and work on it for a little while and sleep in if they feel like it and take a nap here and there you might end up getting more um productivity but i do wonder about privacy and and by the way um mm -hmm. i love zoom um i have to say that because they do have pictures of my butthole um and and so if i if so i so that they don't use it against you later, that's yeah yeah and um so thank you zoom for everything that you do um but in terms of privacy i wonder how much some companies are going to want access to your screen you know um and, and i know this is already happening in the workplace where you could check in at any time and see if someone's playing solitaire on their computer yeah. or whatever. And, and this is, you know, I get it. And it seems like if you put me in charge of things intuitively as a manager, it seems like, yeah, if you don't like check in once in a while, they might just be playing solitaire, but it seems like if you feel like you're being monitored all the time, you're going to ha end up with the same problem that you have um uh currently when it goes to a virtual world i think i think we're already seeing that like even though i what you're talking about that the big brother surveillance cult capitalism is still out there i think we have people checking folks email productivity like when microsoft said this is how much time and calendar or meeting on emails you're spending they can send you that report but don't think your employer can't also see that from microsoft yeah. office or we already know this from like People are logging into whether it's a Slack back channel, a different instant messenger. Um, people, besides meetings and making meetings on their schedules, show up to a web conference. We, that's where I see a lot more people being, give me a check in, give me an end of week report. Um, and I like what you talked about uh, with the hours of the day. Like, who's to say a nine to five or eight to five is actually the work schedule? Because we all have different circadian rhythms. Um, we all work best at different times. And if you've ever given the option to have your own schedule, like you and I are 
pro probably most privileged to do that as a former academic and an, a comedian, you get to pick your schedule when you work, really, or when mm -hmm. you work best and when you nap, when you break, when you do whatever, and uh, when you mess around. And I think it's neat being able to do that, but a lot of our employees have never had that choice in their own scheduled days, even the thought workers. So mm -hmm. forget anyone in a factory fulfillment center. I would say more of our office workers are kind of surveilled more than they think. And mm -hmm. you're right. It's not about uh, the technology helps it, but people have always been checking in on their emails or looking at what's on their screen or like everything you use that, that's a work product is already has people have access to and can figure out like, what are you doing? What are you not doing during the day? So if that's the, I guess, manager's kind of MO, then why do you have that lack of trust of your employees? And then why aren't you hiring better people and empowering them to do the work instead of, I guess, checking in? Because that seems like a lot more exhaustion and micromanaging. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. I like, the, uh, have you read uh, Daniel Pink's book, When? No. You'd like, you'd like that. So it talks a little bit about this time, like when we choose to do things and how we work and when's the best kind of like schedule for you to sleep, work, do your best deep work. Um, I think thinking about when we do things, I hope that this time's given some people that opportunity like, oh, if I don't have that commute of an hour or whatever in the morning to drop off kids or whatever I, I have to do in the morning, I actually have a more productive time doing X and I can do some deep work. Or mm -hmm. maybe that afternoon walk or break or run actually helps me get back in and recharge in the afternoon. So I feel like I hope that some of this um, remote time teaching, learning, working has afforded some people that to think about how they actually want to work and what they when they work best and how they work best. So bring back those coffee shops and breweries when we can work at those again. But um, what when is the time that you best do? x and it should you have a media in the morning when you're more creative in the afternoon i don't know that's really up to what we haven't thought about yeah my uh, i mean i'm my schedule is all always kind of all over the place mm -hmm. but i usually have you know three shows that i'm doing in a week in three different cities and so that's my schedule in terms of like okay that's that's six hours, six, seven sure. hours um, to do a show to set up and, you know, everything else. And then the, the travel time. Um, but outside of that, I'm, I'm always just kind of flexibly busy. And it's, and, and I, I'm not saying like, this is a good idea, but it, it, how, how many, do you know how many like amazing ideas that i've put that i've actually implemented into my career that i came up with drunk at two in the morning <laughs> like in, right. in this right. quarantine and that's and alcohol's fucking you know not great for productivity or creativity or memory or anything else but all of that is to say is that thought work is such an unpredictable um mm. uh, you know, a job and experience is something uh, like harnessing creativity is is such a moving target that the, the the idea of like trying to trying to put that into nine to five work has always seemed crazy to me. But then, in, in just in terms of, um, I think I, I'm having a memory pop up of us maybe talking about the Pomodoro technique. Um, the last time uh, we, I think we, we did. talked. Yeah, like, how do you motivate yourself? And I feel like I think there's some other things about these weird times that we don't get to talk about is it's hard. Like, I actually work really well remotely, but I've, I've stalled out myself, like, because I'm thinking about bigger issues in the world or family members that like I'm have to parenting the parents and tell them to stay home. And, you know, like mm -hmm. other stressors come out of this that you don't think about. So I think I think you're right. Like, we have to figure out not all these productivity or motivation techniques, like you set a timer for 25 minutes to start something that doesn't always work. Or yeah. you just maybe need to like sleep in one day or get off the screen another day, you know? Yeah. Not even do the video chats, just tune everyone out and go sit outside in some fresh air. I did that this morning and I'm feeling so <laughs> much better. It was the That's warmest good. day in Wisconsin since I've, since I've been here. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I took the, I wanted to, I did, the winter and all the south this year and um came back to wisconsin when when shit hit the fan but um but anyway i realized oh my god i've been spending so much time in front of the screen yeah it's a balance but then you know then there's all these 
it, it's funny because there's all these great apps for like everything too. There's like sure. apps to stop you from getting more apps and <laughs> <laughs> like yeah, like your med- the best, your- best meditation apps are on your app. <laughs> you just sit there and be. Yeah, I get that. <laughs> yeah. Um. So, what do you think is going to be? You know, like you said, right now. There's a lot of, and and I know I'm just kind of asking you to speculate a little bit, um, but right now there's a lot of like quick scrambling to um, finish out the semester, like you said. Mm -hmm. Then there's going to be a whole bunch of people that are going to have an entire summer to figure out the best way to virtually teach next semester and maybe receive some new training some new skills, um, figure out how to add a little razzle dazzle and and get fun virtual backgrounds and, and, and <laughs> things sure. like that that you could share. What do you think that that's going to look like once 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 it's no longer just playing catch up and it's this planned? What what's the best kind of virtual university situation look like? Yeah, I think actually some of them have to do this for the summer as well, because some of them have semesters in the summer. Um, yeah. I think schools that have been doing it well have kind of done their continuity plan. The universities and colleges that I know have already said, we're doing this for now as a stopgap till um, April, May. Um, but when it comes to summer and fall, we actually have to think about still not returning to campus and or the idea of half the population coming back to campus because we'll have some sort of physical distancing measures to keep that um, safe and, and secure because we'll see like if this, um, if and when the corona pops back up in the fall, um, what do we do then? And so some people are working on a hybrid approach, some are doing all virtual and I think it's um, tooling up not only the classes that are online, but what are the relevant services? So a lot of people that are outside the classroom teaching, like advising or orientation or admissions, they have, they're like, how do we do this now? Enrollment for colleges and universities have been decreasing. Um, so we have seen some institutions furloughing folks or um, not hiring back some other things. So we're going to see less people probably coming to sk- school uh, not even just a physical campus but a virtual campus Mm. but those that are going online i think are trying to think about like what's the most intentional way to do it what are the classes that we need to be offering um so i think it's going to be a hard time for um people that are going through the degree programs now undergrad or grad but those that are just starting i think some of them won't start this year in the fall Mm. and that's okay like i think that's going to happen as well um Some advice for people coming in is having a campus-wide support. Um, And a lot of places don't always have this. Uh, Small community colleges uh, may have a one shop that are trying to figure this out now um, across bigger schools and campuses. Departments might be doing it on their own. So I don't know if there's always this campus-wide plan for that. Or what I think could happen is some universities sharing across schools and saying, why don't we let our students go between our school your campus and this for this program because we can't offer everything online or we can't do it well so why you know scramble and students pay a lot for university in the u.s i think uh, so why don't we think across community colleges and universities well what would that continuity of education look like and what if we had to be flexible and share and not compete so um that's my canadian pipe socialist dream on there but i will say I, some of the schools that are trying to be like what are the courses that need to be developed that need to be offered who and how are we going to teach them and what is our capacity to actually do this well um, is some of the things you're thinking of beyond the tools and the places but what what's a good quality online and i think a lot of people are doing what you said is tooling up this summer i teach in this workshop uh there's about actually there's 30 people in it this week um usually it's only like a 10 to 15 person but like campuses are like well we need to get people online knowing a bit more about the fundamentals of teaching online or a blended course or what's some ways pedagogically how to do it not just the tools but well what would that mean for how i teach weekly or how do i manage students or how do i communicate with them on a, on a regular basis that they'll engage or they'll be motivated to learn um so I think the semester that when people come back and schools plan to go virtual or online, I think that would put students in the right mindset. Those that were went from in class to all in class to all online, I think they transition, that transition was hard. 
Um, most of our students do a mix of online and in-person classes, but knowing that they're going to do all online, maybe they'll take less classes in the fall. Or maybe mm -hmm. we'll have people teach less because it's a bit of a transition to if you've never done that before. So um, I would hope those are some thoughts that go into it. But I think um, some of that would be having in, coming in with a plan, summer practice, fall implemented fully. Um, and some places are doing that and already preparing. So I think that's really great to see. Mm. What about the, the future of credentials? Um, <laughs> which, <laughs> which, that's you a good know, question. <laughs> I, I mean, credentials always seemed a hair shaky to me anyway, in terms yeah. of like, you know, having these letters next to your name. I mean, we're, 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 seeing, we're seeing this now of like someone being on TV and it's just like, Dr. Phil. Uh, or you know, you, know, you know, or Doctor Drew, or what have Doctor right, Oz, right, like the, right. the, the like, and people, people not realizing, like, oh, this doesn't mean this person knows etymology. This, <laughs> this, the, this doesn't mean this, the, this person understands um, how and why quarantines work, um, right. and and um, you, you know, uh, getting a getting a PhD and um, one thing doesn't doesn't mean <laughs> putting doctor yeah. in front of your name doesn't mean and and it's always kind of you know you want uh, everyone everyone wants the harvard um degree behind them or whatever and helps them get a job but but there there's also um i don't know it, it seems like much of that has just been um kind of uh display you know like a, a costly yeah. a costly display and and then uh, and then the other hand is like you go and you educate yourself and you you go on great courses plus and you you learn everything that there is to know about biology that great courses can teach you and then you go and then you go to a, a different thing and and do a more you know whatever and, and so mm -hmm. so now you've you've spent the last five years learning about biology. Does that make you a biologist? <laughs> if you, if you can't get a, if you can't get a degree that says so, um, you know, how, how yeah. is that going to shake out? Yeah, it's a, a solid question that it's funny. I was asked, I was asked this a couple of years ago. We did, um, kind of a study into like what does occupational success actually look like from a degree and what where does the degree, degree fall short if we're thinking about a four-year or two-year degree because we're entering into um, some automation some changing to the workforce doesn't mean the robots will take our job I wish sometimes they did when I was teaching but yeah. I think um, what some skills are going to be more relevant than not so I did this whole dig into this a couple of years ago into thinking about what's the future of work going to be and you're right will we need to do a four-year degree or will we need to tool up and train and do on on the job training with some micro credential um or badge or whatever it is and i think about um the role of education i think is still relevant because it's always worked on us thinking about bigger picture issues concepts and socialization of who we are. I don't really care about a name because I never, really, my ambition was never to go to an Ivy League growing up. Um, I come from a country that's not the US, so we never really care about where you went to school and what your sports team was. It actually meant about school. So um, I, I, think, I think it's gonna be more relevant that we think about the skills and the attributes that are taught in our form of education, whether it's K-12 or higher ed, but how do we get people to tool up if they need to do more in, uh, let's say data analytics and understand how to look at predictive futures and statistics or if we want them to do something in i don't know user usability or graphic design and design world like is there skills and abilities that can be taught alongside the work and i i think smart schools and institutions that are pairing with industry are doing it well like it's going to be a combination of who's already teaching it, what are the institutions, academic institutions doing, and are they talking to people in the industry? So I feel like there's sometimes a gap between those three things. Mm. And what we're seeing in training and development in industry is we love to get people into apprentice or intern or co-op, but we have to also make sure we're communicating back to those people, teaching them in the four-year degrees because there might be things they're missing or they're not teaching them or there's like a gap that's missing that they don't need to have everything when they come to a new first job or if they transition to a new role but they need to have some ability and propensity to learn 
adapt, use critical thinking in certain ways, and also maybe there's some um, applied skills and technologies that we'd like them to learn as well. But I think it's going to be a partnership between the two. So we did this, like this impact study talked a little bit around um, kind of pillars. This was like back in 2017, uh, digital literacy impact study. And some of the key things we talked about were, yeah, identifying um, ways that we could improve curriculum because some of them are outdated. We already knew that. Uh, ways that we could also improve, um, I guess, the way they're exposed to tools. So students are really good at, let's say, research or finding things, but they couldn't actually design um, products. So they couldn't, at the end of the day, come up with um, some sort of media or medium like this to create video, audio, sound digital and express themselves differently other than like writing a paper which that's not always needed in some industries so i think it's a combination of um looking at who we partnered with in outer orgs uh, maybe industry people sectors and whatnot so this is kind of i don't know our hopes and dreams were to dig into ways that they we could help enhance um things in the future um beyond what we already do is creativity, critical thinking, problem solving. What are some technical skills that we could have them um, learn and encourage them to be ongoing learners? So the mistake that people do when they get a credential is like, I'm done, my degree is finished. I have this degree. I was like, no, that's just a license for you to continue learning. And I think we have to remind people that when you go back to into a workforce, you hopefully will continue to learn and grow and should be adding to that kind of skill bank, knowledge bank. And yeah, I don't know. Anyone who says they're done at the end of a credential means uh, they've stopped learning is what I think. So. Mm. Well, I, um, I, I think one interesting thing is, is that, um, you know, modern, modern life has afforded um, humanity the ability to become specialists to rather than everyone being a hunter gatherer or whatever we've, we've we've figured out ways to to where one person can like really learn blacksmithing really well and and get very 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 good at that and then they can barter with other people that are very good at this other specialized thing and you talk about podcasting i mean to me podcasting is my favorite thing in the world mm -hmm. i never thought i'd like anything more than stand-up comedy and um i i just i my life before podcasting was i would have to go into like morning zoo radio uh where it's like this one size fits all uh like whoopee cushion noises and like dumbed down right. like making things very accessible or or it used to be you know when there's only so many channels the one path to become a comedian is like, well, you better get yourself on Johnny Carson. And if you do, you're famous. And if you don't, you're, you know, there's nothing for it. And so then, so then your, what you can present as an artist is, is limited to that range of like, Hey, we, this, this better be safe enough so that mm -hmm. everyone can enjoy this. And now there's like podcasts for, um, for, playing board games or you know every specialized thing and i feel like education could be the same i, I remember um when i dated a veterinarian for a while she would always she said that you know her education you know she had to throw 80 percent of it out the window once <laughs> she actually became a veterinarian and um and there's there's all of these specialized if you do have like a clear vision of of what you want as things open up globally um it just seems like there's um you know say say you're at mit or something and then all of a sudden you make the discovery oh crap i want to do this thing that stanford is actually like would be a better school to go uh, now as things are opening up virtually it seems like you would be able to do that and and it also seems like there's there's ways of like um, opening up, you, you know, here's like, you want to study zebras? Well, we have an entire four-year plan worked out specifically for people that want to be zebra experts. And, and that's something that, that, um, 
that didn't exist until the virtual world as a possibility. <laughs> yeah, and I like the idea of what you said is opening up is we have room for less barriers. I think some of our ecosystems of how we learn and train um, is we're going to have, honestly, more capability to innovate and in how we do that. Like, it doesn't have to be a, a single institution with these four walls um, that keeps that knowledge uh, to itself, but it can be shared in a different format. So these online courses, like we talked about open online courses, um, these podcasts, people are like talking about really clever things and telling stories behind data and information. I think that's great and fascinating. I also think like how we credential and we'll see more people go into self-directed options, like you said, like they're going to be those uh, learners who want to learn based on interest, need, um, skill, tooling up, or doing something different, like switching up jobs when you turn 40 and going back into industry because you're like, I don't know if I know this anymore. And I want to not just teach about it in an academic sense, but I want to go back into practice to see, is this true? And how has that shifted in the global ecosystem of learning and development? So I feel like, yeah, I think there's more opportunity to be fluid in how that knowledge goes and how we work across domains and disciplines and industries. So I, although I'm not in an academic institution, I do think there's opportunities to bring back and forth that information of um, learning, training, uh, growth into back into our institutions if, if they're open and willing to, because I think some of it has been, let's keep those gates up at the university and not let that out. Or why would we want to share this? Because this, this is bonds to me. And so that ownership idea and control of information, I think is something that not all institutions are great at. Um, so I'd love to see more of that and mm. some honest talk about what that looks like in in different pockets beyond that bubble of a university. Uh, why, why, why don't we have some more collaborative relationships and uh, test things out and get them into practice? Like, why, if we don't do things like that, um, we're not really taking the knowledge into the real world and sharing it and applying it like we should be. So that's my, that's my hope and dream, the utopia of learning. Uh, I don't know what yours is, but that's what I'm hoping to see. I mean, I think this is a pretty exciting time for, for people that are lifelong learners and would like to be lifelong learners or are forced to be life. I mean, <laughs> I'm, I, I used to be a stand-up comedian back when that was a thing that existed. It's, it's the long time be, ago of, of uh, January, 2020. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I don't think that I'll have grandkids, but I'm glad that I'm not going to have to explain what stand-up comedy was to, uh, to a child. Well, well, your grandpa really needed validation. And so he had this thing where it was this big contrived production where we would hang up curtains and get up there in front of a brick wall and, and, and make people think that you were coming up with things off the top of your head that you spent the last two years putting together uh, but, but i i i um anyway we'll, we'll we'll have stand up comedy again but the thing is had had this been had i been a comedian in the 80s and a pandemic happened and no lo and all of a sudden you can't tour anymore i'd be out of luck i i do i do have plenty of ways i can still entertain people and be artistic and and it allows for that and in that in that same way i i think that i hope people shake off the idea of colleges for people in their early 20s and yeah. um and or whatever you went to college for that's the rest of your life i have a, a friend of mine who's i turned 40 next month i have a friend of mine who i think they're turning 39 this summer and they're just like you know, they didn't go to college, they're bright, but they didn't go to college and they're kind of in like a dead end ish job and they kind of beat themselves up for it. And it's like, well, I guess this is what my life is. Like you have 40 more years to go Plus, probably, yeah. Um, yeah. which is, uh, you know, good news, bad news, good news, 40 <laughs> more years, bad news. Oh my God, what are we gonna do with 40 <laughs> more years? Holy crap. But But the idea of like, if if you thought you missed out on college, go to college. Like it'd be four years out of your life. I guarantee you'll be way better at it than you would have been when you were when you were twenty and trying to get laid for the first time or whatever, and <laughs> and have have a bit more discipline and have a little life experience uh, under you. And so I I really I that would be another. 
ideal um, uh, as we're trying to imagine utopias that this might catalyze is, is that I would, I would love for people to see, be like, you know what? I'm 60. I could, in two years, I could be doing, I could be trained and be doing something that I always wanted to do and spend the next 20 years of my life um, do, doing this, this thing that I was beating myself up for, for not ever doing. You know, I think you're right. Like, I actually hope this time that people maybe find that some weird space and time to not only if they're working, that's great. If they're not working, they probably have more time to think about, are you doing the thing you want to be doing? Cause I, I don't know, I quit my job in August last year and I didn't have another job right away. And I just decided that I wanted to look for something that was more meaningful um, and figure out, like, forget the title. Like, I don't care about the na the nouns, as I've heard someone say, um, uh, the things, the titles, the labels, the roles. I like, what are the verbs that you want to be doing? So what's the action and practice and the work? And like, figure out how to get there and talk to some people to learn about that. So I am a, probably a lifelong career explorer myself. So I feel like there's no end to it. And I bet you, you would have had like a phone in radio comedy show, like a 1-800 number where people could dial in <laughs> yeah, back yeah. in the eighties. But I think we've done only more creative things. Like I think about yeah. uh, when we put someone on the moon, the U S did, it was during the cold war and there was more tensions higher. So I don't know. I feel like this is an opportunity that people want to not only reinvent because they have to, but maybe think about, is this what you want to be doing the next 10, 20, 30 years, because you're right. We're not in a job for 40 years plus retirement. It doesn't work that way anymore. The world of work is shifting and changing to have that opportunity to go, well, what am I going to do in the next five to 10 years? And what do I want to be doing? And not think of it as like, this is me and this defines me, but what is, what do I enjoy doing in my life? Who's really important and the things I want to be doing. And then how does work fit into it? Cause it's a big piece, but it's not the only thing. Like, I think it's, People have vocations, people have jobs, people have careers, and maybe they come in together, but they don't always fit together. So figure out what you want to be doing. Um, yeah, I, I mean, it's also it's also created such opportunity um, for blackmailers as well. You know, like it used to be, <laughs> if you wanted pictures of my privates, you'd have to figure out where I lived. You'd yeah. have to like uh, get, figure out how to like get the camera through my shades at night, and sure, then sure. and then you have that picture now. Uh, to what to show it to people? What are you gonna mail it around to people? Right. You're gonna show right. it to my now so easily you can have a picture of all of my naughty bits and <laughs> and you can you can put it out there on the internet for every everyone to see and so you know i think this is an exciting time for zoom who i love and support mm -hmm. and will never say anything bad about um, <laughs> <laughs> well i think i think it's what you've said though is right that we aren't the first people to do this or think about life and how what our career and work looks like and i i love uh, i guess i do have two other podcasts that i do learn from podcasts hello monday is one of them uh -huh. uh, it's sponsored by sponsored by linkedin not a sponsor uh but they interview people from uh elizabeth gilbert the writer of eat pray love to seth myers about when they kind of figured out um where they were what they wanted to be doing and everyone has a different backstory to get there and i guess the long form podcast is the other one um there's usually writers on there but there's lots in radio comedy other areas of how they shape the work and create the work they do and when you hear what people have behind them in the background and their experiences or what they're exposed to like it's really cool to see that there is no one straight path nothing ever makes sense some of it's luck some of its opportunity and luck they've made. So I think those kind of shows remind me in terms of career. And that's something I've always shared with my students when I taught a class on career development is it's never fluid. It's a bit of what you make it. And so if you're not learning more about you and other things you want to be doing, then I think you stagnated your career maybe, but you, there's opportunity for you to keep trying. So I think it's cool that you're still doing this. Um, Cause I think you, it sounds like you've been learning a lot from all the science and science friends in your community and people that listen with you. Um, so I think that's great. Like, I think having a podcast is a great way to learn too. So good for you. And I've been doing like, I've been doing web series mm -hmm. stuff for the first time in my entire career. So I've been acting for the first time in my career and like Ooh, liking it fav more than favorite I ever. Favorite role? Favorite um, role in, a, in an acting web series? Uh, oh, it's, it's just me. Um, I, <laughs> I, I, I have a, I have a web series called Quarantine Couple. Um, oh, nice. and, and it's, uh, 
It's just the premise is, is that I'm a Postmates delivery driver that got quarantined in someone's house while I was dropping off their, um, their thing and everything went on, quarantine. on lockdown. And, uh, and it's, been, uh, it's been fun and silly. And, uh, and then I've been like making memes for some reason. I've always hated memes because I'm like, why don't people just make their own damn meme? I, I mean, I guess it's easier for me to say I'm a, I'm a comedian and I can create things like that. But I've always just like, I've always been like, why don't, why can't people think for themselves? Why are all of their political attitudes determined by someone else's cat meme? And so I was like, <laughs> I'm going to make my... <laughs> my own damn memes and uh and i've been like doing instagram live things and chatting with people and and like some of the stuff i hate some of it um i like way more than i would have ever imagined and um and so yeah it's been uh it's been it's been a pretty interesting uh experience and so and and, and so I, I i hope that there's some people out there um that that are having the the similar i know that there's a lot of people out there that are having a similar experience of getting to oh boy I always wanted to learn how to garden or whatever and like getting to do things like that <laughs> making and... sourdough bread or blah, blah, <laughs> yeah. super cleaning yeah i would say honestly if you want to make stuff this is and you have the time and freedom and luxury to do that the more you make and create, the more you put things out there, you'll find those gems in the middle of it, right? Because Shakespeare wrote a bunch of stuff that is pure crap. And then the yeah. few things you know in his catalog is like the small percentage of 5% of what his bigger work is. And so I think like stuff like that is keep producing and creating and making. I think that's great. I, I heard, I don't know if this is true. I'm sorry if I'm part of the fake news spreading around <laughs> well, fun you can fact info. Check it later if you want. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I, I heard I heard that Newton thought of his idea of of gravity while quarantined. Um, there are some other people who have talked about that, and I think there's a couple of writers. Hemingway was another one, also mm, while mm. in quarantine. Yes, yeah, so you're right. We could be perpetuating fake news, but. I feel like their quarantine times were very different. They didn't have fun things to waste. Like, like streaming, all the streaming services of music, TV, and whatnot. So, yeah. I mean, I, I think it's just any any time that we are um, given the opportunity to completely re-examine life, whether we're doing it by choice or it's forced on us <laughs> by quarantine, it's it's going to lend itself to some uh, some creativity. So. So I exciting so. times. So, well, thank you so much for joining me and having a lovely little chat about uh, about virtual learning and training and uh, into the future. I, <laughs> I, I, are, are there already, I imagine there's people, if I was working a job, I would just take an hour video of myself, like working nodding my job. head. <laughs> and then oh and putting it into a call and, and then putting it in, in, into the virtual <laughs> conference call that's not a bad idea that's actually. not a bad idea <laughs> I, I i don't have a lot of those uh, for unfortunately not to have a lot of video calls we just do the work and then meet for 10 minutes 30 minutes here and there but uh that is a solid plan for the you should offer to yeah. do those sort of videos for people that can be your production on the side, uh, the, side yeah lesson. well that's that's the thing with the as we talk about privacy and monitoring and everything else there's gonna mm -hmm. we're gonna have to think of new hacks you're gonna have to think of new what what is your virtual handicap bathroom that you can sneak off to <laughs> so no one knows where where you I'm went already trademarking the rent a kid or rent a dog in the background uh, that, that, so that's, see, look that's at us, mine coming up so with you, ideas you got you it. work on your own uh, you, i got, I got, I got the videos of 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 yourself <laughs> uh, uh on on a loop <laughs> you can add backgrounds to them too if you want you'd be like background and head nod uh, uh, that's that's uh, uh that's gonna be funny when the um you know the virtual meetings run like a little longer than anticipated and then you see that you see the skip <laughs> you notice the skip when someone starts looping like hey yeah. frank's not actually in the room <laughs> um uh, yeah, or, I look forward to more creativities and innovations that people come up with. So that I think this is good. So good luck. I yeah. can't wait to see what your next uh, adventure in comedy digital is going to be like. Yeah, who knows? We'll see. <laughs>
<laughs> it's scary and exciting. So thank you for joining me, Laura. And, Not a problem. Thanks for having me, Shane. Yeah, hope to uh, maybe see you in person again um, uh, one of these years. Um, so uh, best of luck <laughs> with everything. Probably in Seattle. Yeah, I'll come by, drop by. Seattle? Your town. Yeah. Oh, you moved to Seattle with your new thing. Great. Yeah, I moved there, moved back. No, I'll move back again, hopefully at the end mm. of summer. Nice. Yeah. All right. Love Seattle. All right. <laughs> cool. Well, uh, maybe I'll uh, maybe I'll hit you up when I when I um, come through next year. Maybe that's when touring will happen again. Um, and thank you, listeners, for being such wonderful, curious people and tuning in. And I'll talk with you next uh, uh, episode. Are we? Yes. Where are we? Here. Why are we here? Not entirely clear. We are misfits thrust into existence by random chance with no hints at all as to how we're supposed to make sense of it all. It's immensely bizarre. Here we are.